want to join the ruddy army. Oh, I don't want to go to war. I want to stay at home around the streets around. And live upon the earnings of a lady typist. I don't want to buy this in the wind by. Things, faces, friends, places, years and moments half forgotten. Laughs, fears, songs, tears. Memories are made of this. forget when the world was bogged down in mud, barbed wire and death. A time when all, friend and foe, had to stay where they were, unless they could find a better hole to go to. What my Uncle Charlie was doing out in Salonica in 1916, well, his guess is as good as yours. Ever since, Uncle Charlie has been trying to explain himself, but somehow nobody ever seems to want to listen. Anyway, Uncle Charlie says it wasn't much of a place, Salonica. Well, not in 1916, anyway. He wasn't too downhearted, though. If you knew of a better owl, go to it. That's what he always said. Salonica was in Greece, my uncle thought. He recalled that everyone was there to fight the Austrians and the Bulgarians. First, besides the British and Uncle Charlie, there were the French. Well, it wasn't difficult to pick them up. But then, too, there were a lot of others that Uncle Charlie has always been a trifle vague about. When I looked it up, I came to the conclusion they must have been Serbs. After having been overwhelmed by superior forces a year before, the Serbs had returned to Salonika to fight on. A solid bunch, Uncle Charlie thought. Good spirited and always spoiling for a chance to get at the enemy. Come to think of it, the only Greeks my uncle ever saw did the washing up around the camp. But whoever they all were, every once in a while they would repair together to the local calf to drink to victory for the Allies. As Uncle said, there were worse places. Places like Mesopotamia and the rest of the sandy, dusty Middle East where the Australians and New Zealanders were battling alongside the Arabs to beat the Turks. Or places like the Eastern Front, snowbound for so much of the year with temperatures low enough almost to freeze the blood. There, the Russians were fighting the Germans the Austrians and the Turks again. I tell you, it was quite a battle in itself to make up your mind who were your allies in 1916 and who weren't. Then there was another uncle of mine on the Western Front, Uncle Ernie. Since those days, Uncle Ernie has said very little except to matter once in a while words like wipers and the salient and Paris, and then other words which the censor won't let me repeat, even if I wanted to. But wherever you were, Uncle Ernie has hinted it was all the end. The constant shell fire, the horrible drumbeat of the guns, the rat-infested mud ditches called trenches, the gas that came over when high explosives didn't. Yeah, on the Western Front, a better owl took some finding. There was a kind of quiet resignation among the people you fought alongside, as though you were all united by a common bond of hate. Not for the enemy so much, because you had a fair idea of how he must feel too, but for the whole miserable, murderous massacre. Yes, that's what it was. No, in 1916, there seemed no way out, no better hole for either side to find.
for London and other British cities, those were the days of ambulances meeting the trains as regularly as, well, as the trains themselves. The days of ambulances and the days of flags. Buy a flag, mister, and help the wounded, the blinded, and the maimed. Oh, yes, madam. Yes, sir. It's all for a good cause. And for the same good cause, too, the garden parties and the jumble sales and the concerts. Not to mention the tea parties and treats for the wounded themselves. The British had acquired people slow to reveal their innermost emotions, and on Britain's conscience was the debt she owed to those fighting her battles. True, many had done the same before in many a war, but never on such a scale as this, and never at such a cost. What is the measure of a nation's conscience? The measure of its bitter realization that it is giving up for some vague objective called victory, not only its material wealth, but its very self, the flesh and blood, brains and eyes that make it a nation. New limbs for old, for the old lost somewhere over there amid the mud and the wire. That was the kind of horrible new industry that two years of the Great War had brought to Britain. What did you do in the Great War, Daddy? I got myself a new leg, son. To hide her pain, Britain in 16 fell back upon her patriotism and a firm belief in the rightness of her cause. In London's Lord Mayor show that year, much of the display was of the things of war, the men, the guns, the captured German planes. Then there were the receptions for the heroes, the ones that stood out even in a land of heroes, the processions, the speeches by the mayors. Maybe to us now it rings a shade false, but in truth, it was Britain hiding her pain under a bushel of patriotic fervour. By 1916, the Labour movement that had for so long resisted had begun to accept the repulsive idea called conscription. True, there were demonstrations against the calling up of certain married men before the single ones, but even these were tempered with the will to battle on to victory. After all, the British weren't the only ones fighting and dying.